So yes, this is probably going to be uh, a little bit different than uh, the other talks that you've been hearing because I'm going to really focus on the computational challenges uh, which come from the biology problems that you're all trying to solve but really come from the lar very large data sets that are being generated by sequencing. So I'll give you kind of one uh, slide of advertising um, to give you a little bit of an overview of what NERSC is generally besides the, the work that we've been doing with JGI um, and we're, we are running some of the JGI computing systems at this point within the NERSC division. Um, NERSC is uh, a user facility of its own. I said I was very impressed to see how many people are here in the audience because our user community tends to be a little harder to drag out to our user meetings and they, they like to attend classes and things like that over the web. But um, we have about 4,000 users um, at NERSC and um, we, we also count our publications. So we have about 1,500 publications that are produced every year by computations that are done on the NERSC, um, on the NERSC facility systems. And we cover a very broad spectrum of science. So we're not by any means focused on um, bioinformatics or, or even more generally on biology. Um, you can see a little pie chart there of the different scientific areas that are covered at NERSC. Um, and it is, but it does cover the spectrum. It is a Department of Energy um, laboratory or facility, and so we focus on, on Department of Energy problems, but they include energy, very kind of core energy problems, as well as basic science problems that really come from uh, physics and things like that, and material science and chemistry that are kind of beneath the, the uh, more applied sort of energy problems. We have a number of, of large computing systems on the floor um, and uh, cl smaller clusters as well. Our largest and newest system is a system named after Grace Murray Hopper, a famous computer scientist. If you don't know who Grace Murray Hopper is, um, she is the uh, inventor of the COBOL language, uh, which uh, isn't used much anymore, but it is still used in businesses. And um, she also invent coined the phrase bug. So um, she was the first person that had a computer bug. Uh, it was actually an insect inside the computer system. And, uh, um, that, that system is uh, what we call a petaflop system, so it's 10 to the 15th floating point operations per second, which is a lot of, a lot of floating point operations um, that uh, it, can, it can perform in, in a single um, second. This is uh, what the, the performance of the computing systems at NERSC have looked like historically, and I'm just showing you this to show that um, how much the, the computing has improved, and a lot of this has come from improvements in the technology. There's actually modest budget increases um, in this exponential growth curve, notice that it's a log scale, um, and the, uh, but most of this has come from improvements in computing technology that have allowed us to exponentially increase the size of the computing systems at NERSC. Roughly speaking, we try to install a machine that's about 10 times um, larger than the previous system every three years or so. So that's what we're looking at moving forward, and so we're, what we're looking at right now, we've got a petaflop system, as I mentioned, and our goal would be to install an exascale system in 2020. That would not, by, by the way, be our next computer system. As I said, we want to install one every three years. Um, but computing is going through a dramatic change right now, and um, it is coming from some technical problems that I'll talk about in terms of the power that, that go, goes into computer system that's really affecting our ability to continue um, in the innovations in terms of the computing performance. Now, if you're just worried about biology and your, the um, sequencing, you may not be so concerned about computing, but you should be because um, the, what's shown here in the graph is the um, amount of sequencing that you can do per dollar, um, an estimate of the sequencing needs for the JGI, um, which is the top line, but the sequencing per dollar, which at least is kind of tracking that curve to some extent, um, uh, not quite keeping up, but, but uh, pretty close, and the computing per dollar. So in the computing field, of course, you hear a lot about Moore's Law. Moore's Law says that we double the speed of computers um, every couple of years. It's actually not quite that. It actually says that we double the transistor density every couple of years. And um, we do double the transistor density every two years. We don't necessarily double the performance anymore, which is really why there's a big problem. But what you see here on this graph is another artifact of Moore's Law that is doubling transistor density has been that computers get cheaper and cheaper exponentially. We basically double the per performance per dollar that you can get out of computer systems every couple of years as well. Unfortunately, Moore's Law looks sort of pathetic next to the sequencing kind of equivalent of Moore's Law because the growth, the exponential, the exponential component in um, the sequencing factor is much higher than in the computing factor. So this is a real problem for um, anybody who's trying to do, run a genomics facility or anybody who wants to do lar very large scale um, genomics because it, it, it's soon going to be the case it'll be much more expensive to pay for the computers to analyze the output of the sequencers than it is um, to, to, for the sequencers themselves. 
Now, this is a problem at all different computing scales, and this is something that's quite different than it has been throughout my career in computing, which is for the first time ever, computing performance growth is really about energy efficiency. We've never really before worried about energy efficiency of computing devices when we worried about trying, how, do we, how can we make them go faster. Um, as a facility director, um, the energy associated with computing is, is also really critical to me as somebody who manages the NERSC budget. So um, at, uh, at roughly speaking, we actually get pretty cheap power here in California, but um, in, the, in the facilities, but at a million dollars per megawatt, which is roughly speaking what anybody pays for power, um, then that, that's the, the annual cost of running a computer system. The petaflop system that I mentioned earlier, the hopper system, uses about three megawatts. So about three million dollars just to pay the electric bill every year um, to run that one computer system. Our whole facility runs at about six megawatts, so about double that. So a substantial, that's about 10 percent of our budget, um, a 55 million dollar budget we spend um, just on electricity. If we tried to build a machine that is a thousand times faster, that's the, you know, three more generations in terms of our, our machine installations to get to an exaflop machine in 2020, but if we tried to just do that today with computing technology that's available today, that would require three gigawatts of power. Um, so three billion dollars just for the electric bill every year. So obviously we're not going to build that kind of a computer. And um, if, we try, if we tried to do it in 2018 or so using, looking at the Moore's Law trends, that is the transistor density scale, that we get from Moore's Law, which is still continuing, um, you get this red curve that you see on that graph, which says that the system would consume about 200 megawatts. The goal that we have in, within DOE is to try to see if we can build a computer system that would be a, an exaflop system that would consume only 20 megawatts. That exaflop system, you can think of as kind of the, the, the flag in the ground the, you know, that you want to put once you get to the moon. The real problem is trying to get the energy efficiency of computing systems in general to improve by at least a factor of 100 so that you can afford to build a, an exaflop machine. So an exaflop machine is the same as 110 petaflop machines or 1,001 petaflop machines, and the energy problem is no different. Okay, It's really the same problem. Um, I was involved recently in a, um, in fact, yesterday I was in Washington. We were reporting on um, a report by the National Academies on computing performance, and, and the name of this is Computing Performance, um, Game Over or Next Level, and it's really about the computing performance problem across the spectrum of machine sizes and that we're, the computing, the whole field of computing is at this critical juncture where we really need to um, rethink how computers are built. So a little bit more about that computing challenge so you understand where the problem comes from. This is the Moore's Law curve, which, which really is what, what Gordon Moore said, which is that transistor density is doubling every 18 months. And that is, and, and notice that the graph goes out to 2010, and in fact, we've been on that exponential growth curve. Unfortunately, if you instead plot um, the, clock scale, the clock frequency of processors, so how fast do processors run, that's the red curve, and um, that run, that in, so that's in megahertz. Hertz, and um, uh, it, it has basically leveled off in 2004. It's not quite flat, but the increases since 2004 are, are very minimal. And the expectation going forward is that those processors will not get any faster than they are today. So what all of you know, if you've gone out and bought a laptop or any other kind of a computer recently, is that instead of buying a faster computer, you're probably buying one that has more cores on it. So you buy a Core 2 Duo, that's got a that's dual core processor, maybe a quad core system, or if you go out and buy servers, you might even be buying um, hex core systems or larger today. So um, what we're getting instead is a, a doubling of the number of cores per processor, and that's all because of the, um, the power requirements um, within the cores, and we were unable to make the processors go any faster. And this last line on this graph shows the power curve, um, and we were getting to a point where you could not cool the chips anymore. So you just could not come up with a cooling technology and basically at the thermal limit of being able to run those computing systems. And so that's why um, the, the processor, the performance of the processors has, has leveled off. Um, instead, what we're doing is we're trying to turn down the clock rate on the processors, which actually requires that lower energy, and we can still put more cores on the chip without taking up all the energy that would have been used by a faster processor. Just to give you kind of a, uh, a comparison point here, 
um, to show how energy efficient some of the computer devices are compared to others, um, what you see on the right, this, this is a, a picture of the Intel Nehalem chip. That's a, a quad core pro, uh, system. You can see the four cores there that are outlined. Um, and the little, the little thing up here is the kind of processor, it's a tensilica processor that might be in a cell phone, that is, that it is in some cell phones. Um, so size is, is one of the obvious things that you see from the graphics, but there's also a huge difference, um, a factor of 1,000 in terms of the amount of energy that's used by these two devices. So the, the cell phone processor runs at 0.1 watts, where the uh, server processor, the Nehalem processor, runs at 100 watts. And so there's a factor of 1,000 difference. Now, um, you do lose a factor of 10 in performance, but overall you've got a factor of 100 in energy efficiency from that little lightweight processor. So now the real question is, can we redesign faster computer systems, um, that is high performance computer systems to analyze sequencing data and other kinds of uh, large problems um, that leverage the kind of technology that's been built, that's been really been optimized for low energy. So, um, that, so one of the changes that's coming is trying to build computer s systems out of little tiny cores instead of big fat cores. Um, and um, the other change, though, that's, ha that's likely to happen, and this one's a, a little bit more controversial, is um, heterogeneity in, in the processes. So those of you who've, who've worked with graphics processors units, you've been using a, a heterogeneous system. It's got a CPU in it and a GPU in it. The GPU, by the way, ha is made up of those little tiny cores, so they tend to be very energy efficient. That is, if you can actually take advantage of them in your computation. If you don't run at high efficiency levels um, from the pro for the problem you're solving, you don't get very good energy efficiency out of them either. Um, so this is looking at is kind of a, an abstract argument for why we want a heterogeneous system that is some number of very fast processors, a small number of very fast processors which are going to be very energy hungry, power hungry, and also a, a, a large number of these very energy optimized processors. And the argument goes back to what uh, was called Amdahl's law that is looking at what fraction of, the pro of your application pr uh, program is actually serial. So one minus so F is the fraction of the, of the program that can be done in parallel, and 1 minus F is the fraction that has to be done serially. And what each of these curves says is um, if, you're, if you're running on different kinds of heterogeneous systems where you've got some number of fat cores and some number of skinny cores, uh, the, the, the um, energy optimized cores, how fast will your application run? And what it shows is that unless you've got an application that is 99.9% uh, parallel, you're going to be down here on these other efficiency curves. And you really want some of these um, other kinds of cores that are, that are more high performance cores in order to get reasonable performance out of your application. Now, people say, well, you know, this all sounds good, but, but we really want to just buy commodity hardware. We don't want to buy um, special purpose hardware or something that, um, that is not what the, the market is, is producing for us because it's much cheaper for us to go out and buy commodity computer hardware. If you look at the investments, R&D investments in computer hardware today, um, this is the curve for PCs, okay? So that's what we have been leveraging in our supercomputers and you've been leveraging in your clusters that are analyzing um, sequence data. Um, but but instead, what we want to leverage, what the growth market and the growth investments in terms of the R&D investments to make computers better are coming from these desktop devices, so TVs, DVD players, iPod processors, cell phone processors, and things like that. So the real question now is, can we figure out how to build a useful computer out of these, pro these kinds of uh, processors, or at least something that is, uh, approximates those kinds of processors? Now, the processor is not the only problem. It is one of the big reasons that, that this, the systems today consume so much power, and, and one of the ways in which we're going to have to innovate in order to ever get more computing performance is through the processors. But there's another big problem in the computer systems, which is um, the energy. That energy is not keeping up with the processor performance. So now let's, let's just think about the aggregate performance of a processor. We can keep making those processor chips um, faster and faster by putting more cores on them. However, the, uh, because we're, we're increasing the transistor density, um, unfortunately, DRAM chips, which are also exponentially increasing in terms of their capacity, are not increasing at the same rate. So there was a point in a, uh, um, around 2000 where the, the curve in terms of how much um, density you could put on a single memory chip also turned over. It sounds pretty good. It's doubling every three years, but it's doubling at a, a significantly slower pace than the pace at which the processor density is improving and the aggregate processor performance then once we start putting lots of cores in the chip. The cost argument is the same. 
same, and this is something there again as a, as a center director we worry about a lot when we go out and buy a computer system. People will say, well, why don't you just put more memory in that computer system? And the answer is, um, it, it, I, I can spend 90% of my budget on a computer on the memory system, and people will still come back to me with some workloads, in fact, some workloads in biology, and say, I need more memory. I don't need so many processors. The answer is, I can put double the number of processors in that, that system, and it's not going to really affect the, the total price of the system very much, but it will help some of the other people who can take advantage of those processors. So um, the, the, the cost of memory is really not dropping nearly as quickly as the cost of computing. Now, where does the power actually go in a computer system? Um, this is graph looking at um, moving data in various different, uh, di different parts of the computer system and the number of picojoules, so energy units that are used to move a word of data across different parts of the computer system. Um, this is to perform a double precision floating point operation. Just, so it would be at roughly the same to perform something, uh, an integer operation. Um, and you can see that it's, um, today it's around 100 picojoules to do a double precision floating point operation. If we project out where we think we can get to in the next 10 years, um, that, that comes down to about 20 um, picojoules, but it's still, um, and it, but it's right around there. Now, if we're accessing something on a register on the same chip, um, we actually can do that without ac using as much energy as to perform the arithmetic operation. But as soon as we do anything that goes off chip, we, we are up here at about an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude higher in terms of the amount of energy that's required. And so it's not just about the time. Um, the time to access any data that's off of that processor chip is also so one to two orders of magnitude more than the time to do a arithmetic operation, but the time to go off chip to memory, um, and don't even talk about going to disk, con consumes many orders of magnitude more um, time and more power. So what this means is as we're figuring out how to redesign the computer systems to make them more energy efficient, we also need to figure out how to redesign the algorithms. Unfortunately, when we train um, computer scientists in the classes, I was talking to somebody earlier that, that we, we train our undergraduates today about how to um, design algorithms and data structures for computers, we tell them to count the number of operations in those algorithms. And unfortunately, what we tend to tell them to do is to count arithmetic operations or logical operations, okay, integer or floating point operations or logical operations comparisons and so on. Those are essentially free in that kind of that overall uh, model of where the energy goes and where the time goes. What's expensive is moving the data around. And we tend to not tell people about counting cache misses, because cache misses are a little bit harder to see in your algorithm, but that's what's expensive, and that's what we should be counting. So we really need to rethink the way algorithms are designed and even the whole model for com computing so that we're optimizing for what's important, which is optimizing for data movement, not optimizing for um, arithmetic operations. Now, um, better algorithms overall, though, can really have made tremendous improvements in our ability to use the computer systems and are, have just made huge improvements, uh, many orders of magnitude faster, even higher than what we're, we've gotten from Moore's Law in terms of our ability to solve various kinds of, uh, of problems. Um, this is some work actually was done um, by Kamesh Maduri within the Computational Research Division at, at Berkeley Lab looking at um, better algorithms for things like um, Assembly. So this is a comparison um, looking at an assembly algorithm and um, uh, looking at a parallel, parallelization of this algorithm. And what you see here are the total running times in seconds running on both uh, 64 nodes of a computer system and then 128 nodes. And this is running on one of the NERSC systems. I believe this is on Franklin, which is our, lar our second largest system. And um, the comparison, by the way, is to Velvet. I, and I understand, I hesitated to even show that the Velvet may not be um, the, the state of the art in terms of the algorithms that you may be using, but that was the, what the comparison was for. It took about 12 hours on a 500 gigabyte machine to, to do a comparable problem. So it, you really have to not just look at computing performance as a problem of how can we make the computers go faster, it's how can we redesign the algorithms or come up with new algorithms that will um, solve the problems much faster even on the current hardware hardware and also then be optimized for this, the kinds of systems in which data movement is expensive and computation is cheap. Um, so some of the kinds of uh, problems that you work on when we're um, looking at the bioinformatics uh, sort of workflows are not very, don't really require supercomputers. When we, when we talk about supercomputers, I mean tightly coupled um, uh, clusters of processors that have very high speed networks. So custom designed networks by companies like Cray or IBM, sometimes an InfiniBand network. Um, this is looking at some work that Shane Cannon did, who's here, um, looking at um, running a, a blast problem 
um, on a number of different kinds of machines. And what you can see even across different size uh, machines, there are the x-axis, um, and each of these different types of machines, that the performance is roughly the same. So the last machine there, the Cray XT4, uh, that's the Franklin system. That's our supercomputer. As I said, it's, a, it's one generation back. Um, it's one that we're still running in production. And um, the, uh, but this is looking at also even running in the cloud. So the EC2 cloud running something like um, uh, Hadoop. Um, and so the, the, the point is that for this particular part of the um, genomics workload, which is sort of the opposite of the problem that I talked about in the previous slide, the computer systems do not have to be very tightly coupled because there's very little communication. So you're already um, running a problem that in some sense is, uh, is, energy, um, is energy efficient because it's not doing a lot of communication, at least between the cores. Uh, within each one of those, these, those single threads, I think there's quite a bit of communication up and down in the memory system. So, Given that you have this kind of a workload, at least part of your workload looks like this, maybe you don't even need to worry about uh, supercomputers. Maybe you should just go and buy time in the cloud. Um, and so we did uh, some analysis on what it would cost to run a facility like NERSC in the cloud. And um, the answer is it would be much more expensive than it is to run our supercomputers today. And so this is our, as I mentioned before, our budget is about $55 million. The estimate here, there's a couple of different ways that you can buy time in the cloud. You can either go and promise that you're going to use a certain amount of time all year and get what's, what are called reserved instances. That's a little bit cheaper because you're making a commitment up front for how much you're going to spend per hour and when you use it. Um, or you can use on-demand time which is a little bit more expensive, but you don't have to pay up front, any upfront cost for that. Um, but in any case, the, you can see that the total budget, and we, by the way, have to include the cost of the storage um, of the system, is much more than the $55 million budget that we have today. So this is, comes as some, somewhat of a surprise, I think, to people who've been listening to the rhetoric around cloud computing, which is argued to be cheaper than everything else. Um, cloud computing is cheaper than running your own kind of customized facility because you tend to run at very low utilizations if you're just running um, a single kind of compute cluster, for example, for a single set of scientists. Whereas if you are aggregating over a large set of users, or, as we are at NERSC, where we've got 4,000 users, they're, they're using the systems around the cloud. Um, we run at about 80 to 90 percent utilization on those systems. Those are very heavily utilized, and the, and the systems are optimized for energy efficiency, and the facility is optimized for energy efficiency as well. The other big factor in the cost, which is true with both clouds and true with um, an HPC facility like NERSC, is the number of people it takes to run a computer system. So a large computer system does not take a lot more people to run than a small computer system. And so to the extent that you can then put a lot of this small, these small jobs on a large computer system, you can actually save, um, you can save personnel time as well. And so um, another kind of reason, by the way, why the, the cloud model um, actually is not as cheap as you might think is that for, for whatever reason, um, and somewhat to my surprise, um, the, the Am Amazons of the world are not um, following Moore's law in terms of the price performance of their, their computing. So this looks at the um, traditional kind of Im improvements that we've gotten in terms of the, the um, number of cores that are on Intel and AMD processors, which are those top curves there. The bottom blue curve is the amount of improvement in the price of buying time in Amazon over a five-year period of time. So that, that price dropped by 18% once in five years. Okay? We've installed in that same period of time two computer systems that are, have increased our computational capability at NERSC with about a flat budget by a factor of 10, and they've dropped theirs, which means we're providing time uh, 10 times more efficiently in terms of the amount of computing per dollar um, it, than we were five years ago, and they have, they have done it, uh, improved it only by 18%. So now you say, well, yes, but our workload doesn't really run very well on supercomputers because those supercomputers are kind of tailored to running physics problems and things like that. And so Shane also, and you can talk to him um, offline, he's over there, um, it has uh, done some work to take computations from the JGI workload and put them onto the Hopper system, our newest and most, by the way, most cost-effective system on the floor is the Hopper system, which has 150,000 cores in it. Um, so, and so he's, he's done some work to do some virtualization, to create uh, virtual private clusters and, and to look at um, managing the workflows that come out of a, the genomics workload on this kind of, a, on, on the Hopper system. 
And so we're able to leverage these kinds of HPC systems as well and have actually done this to run some different parts of the JGI workload, including things like um, the QA backlog, um, some IMG quarterly runs, and things like that. So th this is right now requires a fair amount of hand work, if you will, by people um, at NERSC like Shane to try to figure out how to get the workflows um, to run in these different systems and in some cases programming at a fairly low level to get the, um, the things in the operating system and the system level management of memory and so on to work efficiently, um, but we're trying to set that up to make it easier to take advantage of these systems. So with that, I will conclude and just to kind of summarize the main points, um, all computing has to be par parallel computing. So if you think that your workload, because you're only running maybe a bunch of serial tasks, doesn't need to be parallelized in them, if you ever want your program to run any faster than it does today, it needs to be parallel. So anything that needs more computing performance is going to have to be parallelized. Um, architectures are changing quite dramatically. We don't really know what the architectures um, are going to look like in 10 years. It will be a combination of what makes sense from an energy efficiency standpoint, from a performance standpoint, and from a market standpoint. And we don't have a huge amount of control over that, although we are trying to influence the vendors to, for example, when they build game processors, put in features that will make it more usable by the rest of the science community. So these architectures will have many small co cores because that gives us an energy efficiency advantage, and they'll probably be heterogeneous so they'll have some, some number of, of larger cores, that will completely change the way we think about programming them because today we think about programming serial machines or we think if we're thinking about a parallel machine, we think about a very homogeneous parallel machine. Memory is expensive. It's expensive to buy um, relative to the, the processor speed and um, so relative to any kind of parallel computation, it's continuing to, the, the gap between the price of memory and the, and the price of computation is continuing to grow. Um, and along with that is the memory bandwidth, which is very expensive, and the, and the network bandwidth be between the systems. The al this means that the algorithms and the software need to be able to adapt to the kinds of future systems we're going to have, and that the economics of computing are also, is also really changing. So um, as you aggregate computing together in the cloud, I mean, I think what we can see in the marketplace is that most computing is even either moving into client devices. So people, people have been throwing out their desktop machines. I no longer have a desktop computer at all. I have a laptop and um, of course some people are getting rid of their laptops and just going to an iPad. Um, and some people just have their phones that they do a lot of, uh, a lot of their computing on. So things are moving into client, client side devices and then into the cloud. And if you look at an HPC center, it's just a very specialized cloud for pro providing scientific sort of capabilities. Um, we see that trend continuing in this market as well. Um, um, and, and these large machines are optimized for power and they're inexpensive to run per core or per flop or any way you kind of want to come up with a reasonable metric for it. Um, and so you have to you know, think carefully about the economics. I think everybody who's looked at the economics of computing agrees that the, um, the price of power is starting to dominate the price of computing in general. Hardware costs no longer dominate the price of um, building these large and buying these large scale systems. It's the cost of ownership, which is the cost of the people and the cost of the power. And and that really changes um, the way you want to think about, uh, about computing. So, thank you very much. Questions? So we not only need alternative energy, it has to be cheap, I guess is what we in the story. Anybody? Thanks. What role does uh, specialized search microprocessors or coprocessors or programmable gate arrays play in future systems, if any? So um, that's a very good question. So we, we have looked a little bit. Um, in fact, I had another slide I almost showed on also running this uh, assembly algorithm on uh, FPGA-based system. And some, some people at Convey have done some optimizations of that. Actually, I think they were doing optimizations of Velvet on that system and uh, have shown tremendous speed ups from using that kind of specialized hardware. It is, um, it, it's, it's a little bit complicated because as you start specializing the hardware, the cost of ownership goes up again for the system. So if you are running too many specialized systems on the floor, you know, one for the biologist and one for the physicist and so on, um, it, it's not necessarily very cost effective either for you or for a center like us. It's more obvious to us that those are expensive, but it still is expensive. Um, that said, I think we will see things being tailored somewhat more for a particular class of algorithms. So what I'd like to do is to 
look at, say, the whole nurse workload, including the JGI workload, and say, what is the system that we could buy that would solve, that, you know, how can we group people together, the scientific workloads together, so that if there's a need for um, an accelerator-based system, that we could have an accelerator-based system, and it probably wouldn't just be used by um, people doing, running BLAST, it would be people, you know, perhaps running BLAST and running some other kinds of, um, you know, physics, uh, FFT-based uh, visual, you know, uh, image processing algorithms and things like that, and then have systems that are optimized for a different kind of workload. Even with the, I mean, that's the thing that I think has surprised me even in looking at, as, as I've done a little bit about the kinds of workload that is, are behind um, genomics is that there's, they seem to sort of fall on the two ends of the spectrum. There's kind of extreme, embarrassingly parallel work, and then there's extreme kind of graph algorithms, which are really the, the worst, you know, the hardest things to run in a parallel machine. But I think there, there will be a role for those, but you have to be a little bit careful about the economics. Yeah, I was wondering, you know, for those of us who are programming a little higher li li language that's C++ or Java, I mean, I know there's a whole bunch of experimental languages that are much more optimized for parallelism. Do you see traction, or what traction <coughs> or directions do you think are going to, should we start working towards so that our algorithms then can move into these highly parallelized environments? Yeah, so this is my own personal research area is parallel algorithms, and I've, I've uh, worked on the design of two parallel algorithms. One is UPC, and another one is Titanium, which is a parallel dialect of Java, and, um, and it is very hard to get traction in terms of practical impact where people start um, working in these languages. Uh, and people will say, oh, well, you know, the nurse, pro the nurse, nurse user will never change. They'll never add any new algorithms because they just want to run and write code in Fortran. But the truth is, if, in, if there's a big enough incentive that people will change to new languages, and they did this when we put, we stopped building vector machines and started putting clusters on the floor, they switched to MPI. We see a lot of um, use of things, languages like Python within NERSC. Now, that doesn't mean they took their application and rewrote them in Python. It means that they're using Python for what Python works well at, and they're using other things for, um, they're using Fortran and MPI for the rest of the application. So um, I think that the huge transition we're seeing in the computing marketplace in terms of multi-core GPUs and so on, there's a real need for a language to come in and help people use these sort of many core based systems and so I think there's a real opportunity for language to take hold and, uh, and people are looking at those languages. There is a lot of work even in you know, Intel and Microsoft on um, libraries and, and programming models if not completely new languages that, that people are using. Whether we'll get something higher level, I don't know. So unfortunately, the, the things that people are currently looking at like thread building blocks and so on are basically libraries that are added to languages like C and Fortran. They're not, uh, and maybe in C++, but they're not kind of a, a much higher level way of programming. So this is a question that, that you and I have discussed. We have a couple of our DOE program managers in the audience. And so high energy physics and computing grew up together, and high performance computing grew up together. And, and we're, we're suddenly producing high performance computing data sets. How do we get the algorithms that will run on high performance computing and the software connected to a genomic kind of problems? How do, how do we you know, deal with this? this, happen. this you know, it's, it, it's, it's really hard, and I think what, um, what DOE actually has done a very good job of in, in general in their computing program is to build interdisciplinary teams, and they've funded interdisciplinary teams, this program called SIDAC, which brings together people from, say, a physics, uh, astrophysics, for example, with an applied mathematician and a computer scientist all working together to try to solve the problem. You know, physics is maybe a little unusual because they, they, they started building computer systems, and so they just kind of thought they could do everything, but they were at least then very familiar with the computing problems. I think the first... And the challenge with the, any of these interdisciplinary kinds of projects is communication. So it's, I mean, I've struggled with this myself, and in fact, in putting this talk together, which is, you know, am I actually feeling comfortable enough with the algorithms to be able to talk to this audience about what we understand about an algorithm like Velvet? And then somebody says, oh, well, that's not, that's not a relevant algorithm anymore. That's not what we want to use or something. So it's, you know, there's a real problem in understanding the terminology and really getting to the point that you have the, the mathematicians and the computer scientists all working together. But I think it's what we need to do is to develop that language and uh, build these interdisciplinary teams. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll have some more questions later. I want to make sure we stay on time.